Uh, hi, Fatima. Yeah, I'm trying to set up the this link. There are kind of technical challenges. Uh, please, can you confirm, Fatima, if you can hear me clearly? Oh, thank you, Fatima. Georgiana Favor, you're welcome. Nice to have you here. Uh, we're going to be starting like 4 p.m. Eastern time, 10 p.m. West African time, and regardless of the time you are as well. All right, thanks for confirming that you can hear me clearly. Just give me a second. Let me try to reach out to other groups and people due to the change in the link. Please feel free to start dropping questions in the chat. I'm going to attend to all your questions accordingly. So if you have any question, please feel free to drop it in the chat section. Thank you for your understanding. We're going to start in three minutes time. You can as well share the latest link with your friends uh, who you had initially shared the previous one with. Uh, it's a technical difficulty. Of course, we don't have a control over that, even though one tries to you know, eliminate such, but there is always technical glitches once in a while. So the same thing happened, uh, but the good thing is that I'm still able to connect to each and every one of you across the globe. So thank you once again for joining. Again, feel free to Drop your questions in the chat as we commence the section exactly in two minutes time. <laughs> All right, Fatima, uh, I, I'm, I, I've seen your question. Thank you so much. Keep it coming, everyone. Drop your questions in the chat and uh, I will respond to them accordingly. Please feel free to let us know where you are watching this live section from as well. You know, you could, in the first time you put comments in the chat uh, button. You could uh, tell us, oh, this is uh, Fatima from maybe this country, put your country there just to make it so interactive. And again, uh, we have to all do this together. That's why it should be good you ask questions. And when I start running you through some of the highlights of this uh, EB2 NIW, perhaps it's also going to bring questions out. So I believe that strongly. Uh, Georgiana watching from the US, thanks for joining. All right, welcome everyone. It's exactly time. And uh, we're gonna be starting uh, today's uh, live session, which is unlocking the EB2 NIW pathway to your US green card, the essential guide, and this is part one. All right. Um, this session promises to be interactive and informative. 
And uh, as I go through each of these, please feel free to drop in questions as you probably feel like, oh, you are not clear about something or you probably need more, uh, more comments on it, then uh, I'll be able to do justice to that. In my capacity, whatsoever question I can respond to, I will try. If it's something I can't, I will tell you right away that I can't, all right? So um, to start with, before I start taking on questions, let's start with the general overview. Some of you watching are initially aware of what this EB2 is all about. So the EB2 simply stands for Employment-Based Second Preference. Uh, it has two parts, the national interest waiver category and the non-national interest waiver category that encompass for this EB2 in general. Uh, to also let you know that the employment-based category ranges from category one to category five. Category one is for extraordinary ability. Uh, yeah, we could have people like say, for example, you are a professor, but that's a misconception. You don't have to be a professor before you can apply for the EB1A category. Uh, we also have the EB2, like I said earlier, which is uh, specific to the national interest waiver is significant for professionals and researchers. So you don't have to be only a researcher, perhaps you're also a professional, you have work experience, or you are doing some research work, you qualify. And uh, this offers a path to a green card without employer sponsorship or labor certification. Now, this is very interesting because ideally, uh, the employment base, as the name implies, requires an employer to file your petition for you. It requires you to have a job offer. However, the NIW subcategory of EB2 is saying that you do not need a job offer. You do not need an employer to file for you. You, by yourself, you can self-petition for this category. And that is a thumbs up. That's the good thing. And that's why I'm here to assist you along the way. So let's quickly take a look at key as aspect of this EB2, eligibility flexibility. Please take notes. It's open to those with advanced degrees or exceptional ability in areas like sciences, STEM, engineering inclusive, arts and businesses. There is also a misconception why people think it's only for people in the STEM field. No, it's not true. You could be in STEM or not. You could be in the arts or business. It all depends on how you file your petition. Uh, please keep your question coming as we continue. Uh, again, I'm going to be responding to the questions. My eyes are on the, in the chat button. Now, advanced degree that I've earlier mentioned, to be eligible for this uh, category, you need to have an advanced degree or its equivalent. So that means that regardless of the country you obtain your advanced degree from, it's not a barrier. Another misconception is that people think you have to obtain only a degree from the US, United States of America. That's not true. Uh, even though you have your degrees from Africa, from the Middle East, from Europe, it's all acceptable. Now, your advanced degree could also be only bachelor's degree. If you have only bachelor's degree, but there is a clause, plus at least five years of progressive work experience. So let's say you've just up, you've obtained your bachelor's degree five years ago, and upon obtaining your bachelor's degree, you had a work experience, and it counts, it spanned for five years, progressive, non-stop, then that accumulates to equate advanced degrees. Now, on the other hand, if you have obtained your bachelor's degree, you do not have a progressive five years of work experience. However, you have a master's degree, then that also counts as an advanced degree. Moving forward again, some of you have obtained a master's degree and you have just started a PhD. 
whether you're in the first year, second year, or about finishing, or you've already finished your PhD, that degree also equates to advanced degree. Now, there is something. There are some people that progress from bachelor's degree straight into a PhD program without having a master's degree. Now, some of such program would say that if after about two, three years, you would have fulfilled the requirement of obtaining a master's and some institution would not award you the certificate at that time until you finish the entire PhD time period. In such instance also, you could write to your institution if you have already fulfilled the master's criteria of that PhD program, you could write to your institution, you have transcripts supporting that, and uh, you can as well use that as equivalent to advanced degree. Please keep your questions coming as I put you through this general overview. Now, before I look into the chart, let me quickly speak on the second category, which is exceptional ability. For you to be eligible, you must be able to demonstrate exceptional expertise. Like I said earlier, in fields such as engineering, sciences, arts, or business. Now, this exceptional ability should represent a level of skill and knowledge that is notably higher than what is typically found in these domains. So, you know, when you say you have exceptional ability, there are numerous graduates that possess the same type of degree that you have. But what distinguishes you? What makes you different from others? That is how you want to speak to your exceptional ability. It could encompass things like recognition. Maybe during the course of you obtaining your degree, you were recognized in various forms, awards, or you obtained certificates. Some of you, you've obtained numerous countless certifications. All these can contribute to show that you are indeed exceptional in your field. Or maybe certificate of appreciation that people have acknowledged you. It could be as simple as an email draft to say, thank you, uh, thank you for your contribution to the department, to this uh, program, things like that can serve as exhibits to tell that indeed you are exceptional in your field. We're gonna draw more deep as we proceed. Uh, let me take a look into the chat box. And as I, like I said, I'm gonna take it accordingly. And I'm gonna start from the very first question I have here. First, thank you for letting me know that it's very clear. Uh, you can hear me clearly. In case there is any problem with the audio, please put it in the chat, let me know. All right, thank you so much. From Fatima, Fatima is from Iran. Fatima, good to meet you finally. Fatima has always been sending me uh, emails. We've been communicating. We've assisted each other in one way or the other. And I'm happy you joined this session. Now, Fatima said, I tried to prepare my document for petition. And in this January, I got a scholarship from Portugal University for one year. Now, is it good for my petition? Absolutely, yes, Fatima. This is one of the things that you could prove that you are exceptional. The first question is, the scholarship is competitive. It's not just given to everybody. It is only given to selected few persons. So that means the scholarship selection committee have a criteria for selecting successful candidates, right? So these are some of the things you can tailor down in your story. I call it story, uh, that's your petition body to show that indeed you are exceptional. And again, since you have gotten the scholarship, you have an exhibit in, in, in form of credible claim. You know, if you write your petition and you say, oh, I receive a scholarship, to study for one year, the scholarship is going to sponsor my tuition fee, this and that. You know, you want to back it up with an evidence. 
look at it this way. The person, the, the officer, the USCIS officer looking at your petition, who is going to approve or reject or ask for RFE request for more evidence, doesn't know you. He or she is relying on what you have written down. So when you write anything, you want to back it up with a claim. You want to back your claim up, I mean, with an exhibit. So look at it this way. For some of you, of course, you hold an advanced degree. You've done your bachelor's degree. You've written thesis or dissertation or project. And when you write some of this project, they tell you you have to cite each of your source. So look at that citing in test citation of each of your source is like your exhibit that you will present in your petition. And with that, you won't have RFE, request for more evidence, because some petitioner, uh, after submitting, they get RFE from the officer. And what is the RFE all about? Asking them to provide more evidence. That is, they are not clear about the claims you've made. Uh, they are not sure of what you've said. Maybe some exhibit is lacking. So you want to make sure you put down all the exhibit. If you, need a if you have a follow-up question, you probably put it in the chat again, Fatima. Uh, I'm going to continue. We have Georgiana watching from the US. All right. Uh, could you please share more info on EB1A? Yes, I will give a quick insight into it. Now, look at it this way. If I tell you, can you drive a car? And you said, yes, I can drive a car. All right. Can you drive an SUV, which is kind of bigger than a normal car? All right, you can do that. Can you drive a big truck? Can you drive a trailer? Something like that. So I would say that EB2NIW is like saying that in your field, you can drive a car, right? But in the EB1A, you are saying not just a car. I can drive a car. I can drive SUV. I can drive truck. So it's like that. That's just the difference. So. EB2NIW is like national interest waiver, which is just exceptional ability. Let's say it's on this scale, scale of four. The EB1 surpasses the scale of four and goes to maybe a scale of 10, extraordinary ability. So ideally, now the criteria that the USCIS officer used to judge a petition that is submitted under the category of NIW is lower than the criteria that is used to judge that of EB2, uh, EB1, I mean, EB1A in particular. They are different. So that's one thing you should take note of. Now, this is my take on this. If you think you do not really have that eye profile, I would suggest to have a peace of mind and to be sure your petition will be approved apply for the lower one, which is the EB2NIW. If you are approved, that gives you a confidence and probably shows that indeed it works. And what I advise our clients is that you, we can see how we can now leverage on this EB2 assistant petition to take it up to that of the EB1A level. And we've seen clients who have done that before they got approval on this. They decided to try their luck on this, and they've also gotten approval. But again, take notes, EB1A has different judging criteria, which is more advanced than that of the EB2NIW. I believe that is a little bit clear. If you have a follow-up question, please put it in the chat. I haven't talked about uh, this, responded to these two questions. I will take a little more on my notes with you. Uh, perhaps it can bring more questions, and I'll keep looking at the chat. All right, so uh, the national interest criterion. Now, applicants must demonstrate that their work benefits the United States substantially. Yes, that is quite important. But yes, the gist. Someone would say, I'm not in the US. My project is tailored to perhaps my country, my country demographics. So how do I want to transform that into the context of the US? Now, that's what you have to do, 
okay? And there are some work you have done within the context of your local country, right, that you can probably, probably expand it globally, like it can have a global impact. In that case as well, you can leverage on that, that it can benefit the U.S., it can benefit globally your work endeavor or the kind of projects you're working on. So your location is not a barrier. So what this national interest criteria means is that uh, what you do, again, whether in the sciences or art or business, should contribute in a meaningful way to the United States economy, its culture, education, or overall well-being. You know? So um, again, take note of this. Another misconception of people would be that, oh, how am I going to do this? Take note that it is called proposed endeavor, which means it could be something you are thinking of doing, not that you have started doing it. Well, if you have started doing it, that is great. But if you have not, but you have a plan on, on what you envision to do to accomplish, you can still argue your case. You don't have to be a genius for this so-called exceptional ability. You don't have to be a genius at all. It's all about how you petition your case. Now, again, before I look into the chat, now take note that self-petition capability, unlike the standard EB2, now the EB2 is of two legs, the EB2 non-NIW and the EB2 NIW. The EB2 non-NIW is dependent on your employer who is going to file for you. But the NIW part of the EB2 is not dependent on your employer. It is you that can file it by yourself. That's why it's called self-petition. And you can do that from anywhere you are across the globe. Now, lastly, on this session, Take note that this visa category is a game changer as it accelerates the path to residency, especially for skilled individuals, which is also fostering talent retention in the United States. I'm going to take a look into what we have in the comment section before we continue. Again, feel free to drop in questions, make comments, make suggestions as we progress in this. And stay tuned till the end as I will also provide you with more valuable insight. There is a WhatsApp group, which is like a community I've created for us to help ourselves for free, doing it yourself if you so desire. I'm going to provide all that before we end today's session. Uh, Georgia, Georgiana Favor, I beg your pardon if I pronounce your name wrongly. I hope you, I answered your question. Um, from Duro Jaye Kolade, could you let us know where you are, you know, calling from? Please, I have an advanced degree. I have a MSc in mechanical engineering, graduated with merit. I am also a member of American Society of Mechanical Engineering. However, I do not have any paper publication. Duro Jaye and to my esteemed viewers, it is a misconception for people thinking that you must have publications, you must have journal papers, and your papers must have been cited by others in your field before you can apply for this EB2 NIW exceptional ability. It is a misconception. It is wrong. That is not true. If you have it, of course, it's part of the criteria that can add, that can help strengthen your petition. However, if you don't have it, the question I would challenge you with Durojaye is that which other part of your story, which other part of you can you leverage on, right? That's how it works. And if I may tell you, even though you do not have a publication that has been accepted, you have a thesis or an unpublished dissertation. So you can utilize your unpublished dissertation. It has an abstract. You made findings. 
you actually did the research work, even if it's a three month thesis or if it takes you six months or one year thesis dissertation, you made some notable findings. You can leverage on that, even though it is not published yet. And for some of you, you've only, let me quickly touch on this. For some of you, you you've submitted only an abstract to a conference, just a conference. You recall that a conference paper is totally different from a journal article publication. So the fact that your abstract is accepted to be presented at a conference is a plus. You can leverage on that. You can, you know, you can switch up the way you write your petition to like, you know, there are numerous uh, number of people, uh, experts in this field that, that normally submit abstract on yearly basis to this conference exhibit, you know, exhibition. And uh, many papers are also rejected. However, due to how the, the reviewers find your abstract to be of the 21st century, making notable impact, your abstract was accepted. And there are some cases that in that abstract's uh, acceptance, the reviewers will make comments. Some of them are great comments. Those comments can serve as part of your exhibit to say, see, this is what I'm working on. This is what I intend to work on and look at what a reviewer who is an expert in my field have said. You can do a screenshot of all that and it can be an exhibit. So it's a plus. You just have to see how you can sell yourself very well. So if you have, again, to Duro Jaye, if you are a member of a professional organization which aligns with your field, that is a great plus. Now, for Favor, who we'll asked about the difference between the, the EB1A and the EB2NIW, let me also tell you something. For the EB2NIW, if you make a claim that you belong to a, a professional organization, just like Duro Jaye said, and uh, you've been contributing in one way or the other, you've been learning from the peers, you know, to, to increase your level of expertise, you've been attending meetings and the likes. It can work like that for the EB2 NIW. However, for the EB1A, it will be all what I've said about the EB2 NIW plus what exactly, what main impact have you made in that organization? Do you hold leadership role in that organization? Show us evidence of those leadership role you have in that organization. All these can contribute to strengthening your petition. I hope this session is going so well. Again, let's make it fun, drop in questions, and uh, let's see how we can help ourselves. Uh, Carlos, nice to have you here. Hello, thank you for your contribution. Thank you, Carlos. Is the embassy appointment for the visa after the priority date in table A, final action date of the visa bulletin? Uh, Carlos, let me try to understand the question. Is the embassy appointment for this visa after the priority date? Okay, so, uh, let, let me try and speak to, to all of these. And if you feel uh, I have not answered the question, please try to ask a follow-up question, Carlos. Now, presently, the EB2 NIW, if you applied today and you are approved, that is just stage one. That is step one. You have been approved. The next thing would be, Either you adjust your status or you start your immigration process. You adjust your status if you, the petitioner, whose petition has been approved, reside in the U.S. or you are currently in the U.S., then you can proceed to adjust your status. However, if you are outside the U.S., you cannot adjust your status. After the approval, your notice receipt of approval will be sent. In fact, let's put it this way. There is a form I-824 that you will fill that will tell the USCIS offices here in the US to send your approval notice 
to the consular office in your home country. So your consular office in your home country will receive the approval notice that, yes, Carlos has been approved for an employment-based second preference national interest waiver petition category. And so when the consular office in your home country receive this, they will reach out to you and give you updates on how to go about applying for your immigration visa. So you will still have to pass through the consular office of your home country. But here's the thing. The difference between you and someone else that applies for, let's say, a visit visa, which is a non-immigrant visa, or a student visa, which also is a non-immigrant visa, is that when you do your immigrant visa and you are approved, then in going to the U.S., you are going to the U.S. as a permanent resident. That is the difference. I hope I answered the question. Please feel free to ask a, a follow-up question. Before I look into the question section again, let's take a look at some of the things that uh, I have for you. Now, the EB2 NIW application involves several steps. Please drop questions. It is when you ask questions, we can elaborate more on this. Now, the application involves evidence collection. See, evidence is very important. And this is what we call exhibits. Because any claim you make, you have to back it up with an exhibit. The immigration officer is not going to assume. They do not know you. They only know what you have written down in your petition. So you want to make sure the content of your petition is convinced, is clear, and is understanding to grab the attention of the USCIS officer. And any claim you make, be very careful of any claim you make, you must back it up with exhibit. Say, for example, oh, I was the leader of the American Society of Mechanical Engineering. You know, you, you, you made those statements that you did this, you did that. And there is no exhibit that shows truly that you were a member, that shows truly that you, you did some impactful work with them. Such petition, if care is not taken, will receive RFE, which is Request for Evidence. So that's just an example. If you claim, for example, that oh, you receive a scholarship, like we have one of our uh, viewers said, you receive a scholarship and the likes, and you could not provide any exhibit to that effect, it can bring about requests for evidence. All right, let's take on another question before we continue. I have a question from uh, Duro Jaye Kolade. I am currently in UK, United Kingdom. I have a visit visa to USA. Uh, that question is not complete. Kolade, if you are on the call, please kindly expand more on that question. Well, if you are currently in the UK, it is not a barrier for you to apply for this. In fact, Kolade, uh, it's a big plus that I assume your home country is Nigeria and you've left the shores of your home country, you are now in the United Kingdom, you studied in the United Kingdom is a plus. That means you have a degree from your own country and you have a degree from the United Kingdom. That is a plus. You can you know, utilize some of these very well. I have a visit visa to USA. If you have a visit visa, that is probably gonna be a B1 visa, which is non-immigrant visa. My advice to you, Kolade, is that See, we have many people that have entered this country through a visit visa, right? And uh, they can always find their way around, you know, how to adjust their status or what to do thereafter. But if you are a professional and you have a degree already from the UK, why not use this opportunity of EB2 NIW and have an immigrant uh, visa that can make you have a permanent residency. It might take a little time, but try and do that. We have some persons too also that have entered with this visit visa and they have progressed to applying for this EB2NIW as well. 
it doesn't matter. In fact, let me tell you that let's assume that you violate the terms of your visa in the US. It doesn't stop you from applying for this EB2 NIW. That's a good news also. The only thing is probably you're going to pay extra, which I think a thousand, I think it's a thousand dollars extra because there is a form you're going to fill, which is the when you want to adjust your status, which is going to ask you if uh, uh, you've stayed longer than expected, you've breached your the terms of your uh, non-immigrant visa and the likes. And of course, they will have access to your record because when you want to adjust your status, you will also fill certain forms that will request for the date of admission to the US, you know, the stamp evidence, the visa evidence, things like that. So you cannot hide it. Again, in summary to your question is that if you like, you enter the US on a visit visa, you can still progress to apply for your adjust uh, for this uh, EB2 NIW while in the US or outside the US. But you have to put to note so many factors. You know, for example, uh, you can't come to a country without having anyone there. How do you settle down? How do you work legally? You know, things like that. So consider your options so well. Again, from another viewer, do I need to do a West evaluation? Wow, this is a great question. And I'm going to be sincere with you. Uh, one sec, please. So those that do not know what West is, is World Education Service. So it's an evaluation complaint. And uh, I think it's a North American complaint that does uh, evaluation of credentials like your academic degrees, especially you know when you obtain your degrees from a foreign country, other than the US, uh, you want to do this evaluation to show the equivalency of your degrees. And you know in the evaluation, if it's a full evaluation that looks into your transcript as well or your degrees, we'll be able to say at the end of the day that yes, this person obtained a degree from South Africa, uh, it's a bachelor's of science in, in chemical engineering, and it's equivalent to a four-year bachelor of science degree in the United States, something like that. So that's the essence of WES. It is good. If you have the opportunity to do it, please go ahead and do it. Because beyond this immigration uh, filing, uh, it might still be advantageous for you. Maybe some job opportunities you will have later in the future or some kind of education you have, you want to, you know, run later in the future. Some programs might, you know, use this West verification. But here is the thing, and I will be sincere with you. We have some of our clients. In fact, in particular, this person, let me tell you about this person. This person did a West evaluation about, I think, four years, about four or five years ago. And that West evaluation was for Canada, Canada immigration. The person obtained the West evaluation, he, uh, he, has, he, he has it. And uh, when this person was to file for this EB2 NIW, he didn't do a West evaluation that will be addressed to the U.S. immigration. No. He still utilized the one he had used many years ago, since it's still valid for Canada. And this person also went online. You know, you could also go online on this West Evaluation Service Center, for example, and you could check your country, your degree, or something like that. Then it's going to tell you that, yes, your degree is equivalent to this country, to USA or but it will tell you it's unofficial. I remember that when we did the petition of this person, this person also put that as one of the exhibits, even though it's unofficial. And the person got approval. Now, one of the degrees of this person was not evaluated, just like uh, uh, the viewer we have from the UK. So this client also had a degree from the UK. It didn't do a West evaluation for that degree, and that degree was included in the petition. And the petition got approval without a request for evidence. 
So what I'm trying to say in essence is that it's a case by case basis. Some will tell you it's a must for you to do the West evaluation and they will do it. They can still get RFE, they can still get their case approved or not. And some did not, and that did not disturb the application. And here's what I'm gonna tell you. Follow your conscience. Do what your conscience can take. You know, if you feel you can do without it and you feel okay that yes, I have a strong petition and my petition is gonna be approved, then go ahead. But if you feel like it's gonna be some out to you, then just wait a little while to do your evaluation. And of course, it's not only West. Some would say or argue that West process is lengthy, is uh, more money or something like that. You can check on Google. There are other services that are acceptable that you can use. If you are not using West, ensure that you have your degree certificate because if you claim an advanced degree, you should have a degree certificate, right? That you can show as an exhibit that yes, you graduated with a BSc with, an, with a master's degree. You can show your transcripts. It doesn't matter the kind of grades you have. You can show your transcript as well, which is very clear. Present it as well. So I think if you have a clear certificate, and a clear transcript presented, there might not be a need for West, and you can still get your case approved. So that's gonna be my take on that. Keep your questions coming. I hope this session is insightful. I hope you are not regretting that. Why did I even attend this session? In one way or the other, I believe you are getting something out of it. So, uh, Let's speak more quickly. Uh, I want you guys to put in more questions, please. Put in more questions in the chat. Uh, ask questions. That's when you can know. Uh, you can put some additions or comments as well. So, uh, of course, your academic record, I've spoken about it. Uh, that's your proof of degree or any similar award you have obtained in your field. For some of you, employment letters, you have work experience, you can you know, use that as well. What did you do during the course of your job? Not just saying this is the job description expected of your role, no. What did you do in that capacity that is making you exceptional in your field? You have to tell that story. Professional license, some of you have professional license in your field. Some of you, you've obtained big salary, huge one that can show that indeed you are exceptional in your field. You can utilize that as well. I've said earlier, some of you are professional member of some organizations. Some of you have received recognition. You've had leadership roles. You've received awards. You've received certificate of appreciations. See, again, it doesn't have to be this mighty big thing that shows that you are genius. That's what people think. No, it's all about smartness. It's all about how smart you can write your petition. Please take notes. That's all about it. Look at it this way. Some people go to the court, even though ideally, they are the wrong people, but they will provide evidence and back it up with their claim and fact that shows that they were not the ones to be blamed and they will win the case. So that is how it is. So putting your best foot forward in order to win your case. Please drop in questions. Maybe I'm going to do something from, uh, for our viewers. I think I'm going to do something. Uh, the more questions we have in the box, maybe I uh, would give such person an opportunity to have a further one-on-one -on -one session with me for free, uh, where you're going to be able to ask more questions. So let's have it engaging as much as we can. I have a question from, uh, forgive me if I wrongly pronounce your name, I did Adedre ADCG. Again, I apologize for the pronunciation. When attaching evidences like research papers and manuscripts, 
Do you include all the pages if they are bulky? This is an excellent question, Adeshiji. No, you do not need to include all the contents of your paper. Say, for example, you've written a research paper that's about 20 pages, single space, depending on the, the article criteria. Do you have to put all those 20 as your evidence? No. Let me tell you a trick of what you can do. When you're writing about this aspect, that research paper as an abstract and your abstract as the background, the method you use, a little bit of justification, it has maybe your methods, the kind of method you use for your data collection. It has your findings and little discussion. It has probably conclusion or probably recommendation for future work. Let me tell you, you can reconstruct that abstract to be part of the content of your petition. When you are speaking about some of the things you have done or your area of proposed endeavor, so speak more to the justification as to why you did that research, that research paper. You know, that justification makes the difference, right? Then speak about your foreseeable findings or the findings you've already made. Speak about it also and tie it to your field and tie it to what you are contributing in that field. Now, when you have written that as part of the content, of your petition to back it up as an exhibit, right? If you have submitted the paper or the abstract to a conference, like I mentioned earlier, you can snipe, you know, screenshot or snipe the submission page to that conference as the evidence for that claim in the petition. I believe that is clear enough. If you have not, if you have presented it as a poster, some of you use poster presentation, right? If you have a picture of when you did the poster presentation, you can as well put it as exhibit, right? If you don't have any of this, the full abstract or finding sections or the abstract that has the abstract, I mean, that has maybe the name of the author or the co authors, you can as well. Take a snipe of it and put it as part of the evidence. So that way you've done justice to it. And let me quickly add this. If you are not the only author on such research paper, if you are not the, even if you are the first author or you are the last author, you also want to specify. Now, again, difference between EB2NIW and EB1A. In EB2NIW, you might just you know, write about the abstract, the paper, and the general findings, and you provide exhibits. In the EB1A, it goes beyond that. You want to speak directly into what exactly was your role in that paper that has co-authors. You have to speak more to that, and you have to back it up with evidence. Let me tell you this that you do not know. If you are co-authors, for example, some of you, you, you do meetings while you are doing the research paper writing, maybe on Teams. Uh, some use other, other means. Uh, you can screenshot some of your meetings or maybe an email that was sent to you by the first author of such paper that says, oh, you, this person, you, uh, you're going to do this, and you reply to the person, yeah, find, find submitted my part of the paper, something like that. All these can be exhibit, even as just like an email, email conversation can still serve as exhibit. It doesn't have to be that big thing. Take note of that. All right, so uh, before I look again into the questions section, now, for the NIW, which we've been talking about, quickly, let me say something. Take note that since 1990, now, this exceptional ability, it's for individuals, uh, 
that have a job offer waiver in the national interest. And this waiver is what is known as the national interest waiver, which is only applicable for the EB2 visa category, professionals with advanced degree or exceptional ability. A job offer waiver also exempts the labor certification requirement. Now, for other categories, uh, other than the NIW or the EB1A, your employer, like I said earlier, is going to be the one to file your petition for you. And they have to pass through obtaining the labor certification, fulfilling the labor certification requirement. It's a long stage before when they are accept it's accepted, they got approved before they can even progress to applying for you. But NIW is not taking in that into consideration. So petitioners must prove they qualify as advanced degree professionals or exceptional ability individuals and that the waiver serves the national interest. Now, lastly, before I go into the comment section, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services refers to as USCIS evaluates petitions on a case by case basis, like I said earlier requiring petitioners to demonstrate three things in addition to your exceptional ability or your advanced degree. Three important things which must be included in the contents of your petition. One, substantial merit and national importance of your endeavor. And that's what we've spoken about before. Again, some of you say it's difficult to write how is it difficult? Prof. Dan Tutorials already provided elaborate video content on each of these. And many people have gone through these videos just the same way we watch movies. I've gone through these videos, pause, write, pause, write, and they have self-petitioned by themselves and they have gotten approval. So if you have questions, Honestly speaking, your questions are answered in these YouTube videos, which people pay for. I, I, I know people that they take classes on this. You have to enroll in their class and you have to pay for it. But I've made this playlist about 13 videos that can help you from start to finish to petition your EB2 NIW. I hope you can utilize it and you know thank me later. Second, that you are well positioned to advance that area of endeavor. You are not just saying that, yes, the, my work experience, based on my work experience or based on my research area or papers I've written in my field or contributions I've made in my field, you are not just showing that it has substantial merit and it's of national importance to the US or globally. Uh, that's not just it. You have to go ahead, you know, to see how that substantial, uh, I beg your pardon, how you are well positioned. And to tell the story of your well positioning is very easy. See, you have a past. That's why you've been going to school all this while. You've obtained a bachelor's degree. You did many courses during the course of your bachelor's degree. You can speak to some of these courses you did. In fact, if you add distinction in some of these courses, let me tell you this. It doesn't matter the grade you finish with, whether it's a first class distinction or second class, upper or lower. There are some courses you had distinction. Why not speak to those ones, right? You want to favor yourself, go in the favor direction. So speak to some of those courses you've taken before and how they have well positioned you in doing what you are doing in your field at this time. Uh, in your well positioning, again, some of you have done some certifications. Some of you have done voluntary services in your field. All these things count. Some of you had internship opportunity. Uh, some of you had a break from school. You did one year work. Uh, if it's in the area of your proposed endeavor, you can tell to how you have acquired skills through all these means and how all that has positioned you to, you know, 
channel this area of proposed endeavor. And the last one, the third one, that the benefits you bring outweighs the need for a job offer. Again, all of this, if you are not clear, if it's not clear to you, like ABC, uh, the videos are available for you to watch for free and understand. I'm going to go to the comment section now. I think uh, this, this section is great. Uh, feel free to drop out at any time. I, I'm going to continue for a little more time before we stop this session. And uh, before I look into the chat section, permit me to quickly drop some things in case we have people that are jumping out already. Um, I want you, if you if you so desire, you can join the community WhatsApp group. And I'm gonna put that in the in the chat section just before we continue. All right, so yes, it's I'm gonna drop that in the chat section. You can join the WhatsApp group as well. This group is free, it's free of charge, it's just for us to you know help ourselves. The WhatsApp group, I think it has a link to a Google Drive document. And uh, in the Google Drive document, I'll be putting in some things in the folders that can really be of help to you as you try to self-petition or get more understanding uh, on this whole immigration stuff. All right. So now we're going to go back to the question section and answer more questions. All right, uh, from, oh, okay, Adeshiji is from Boston. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, please, can an undocumented immigrant apply for the EB2 NIW? Undocumented immigrants. Now, when you are filing your adjustment of status, for example, it will ask some of these questions of your you know category and um, it doesn't give restriction to it the only thing it says is that uh, if you are probably undocumented uh, you might have to show more evidence that still shows your stay in the country kind of and um, I'm not sure now if you have to be the one to pay an extra 1,000 or those that overstay. One thing I'm sure of is that those that have defaulted the terms of their visa that brought them into the country, like say, for example, overstay or things like that, they can still apply for this, uh, for this category. And uh, they're just going to pay, I think, a, an extra $1,000. And that's it. That doesn't stop your petition from being approved. In fact, when you are writing your petition, you do not even need to, to tell if you are undocumented or documented. So you will be judged case by case based on what you've written about your exceptional ability. And if you are approved, then you go to the next stage of adjusting your status, which again, it gives you the opportunity to do so. So please go ahead. There is no barrier to this. From Sarah or Sarah, Hello, thank you for this. Please, what is BSC order from Nigeria? What, what's in BSC order from Nigeria with family? Sarah, if you are still there, uh, I'm not so clear with your question. If you can, you know, expand further. But uh, let me just speak generally to it that, yes, like I have said earlier in this video, you can be, you can hold only a BSc, Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Technology so far as you graduate with a bachelor's degree. But uh, if that's the only thing you possess, you must have at least five years of progressive work experience added to your Bachelor of Science degree. That way, you check the boss for advanced degree. And uh, if you have family, take note that in your family, the strongest, the, the strongest person, the strongest profile, let, let me put it that way, the strongest profile should file for the petition. You have the husband and the wife. The husband will not file for this EB2NIW 
and uh, the wife will also file for the EB2 and IW. That's not how it works. One person, the primary applicant, will file the one with the strongest that you feel that, yeah, the case can, can you know, makes more sense. Let the person file. And that's the fourth stage. And you're gonna, they call, also call it the form I-140, right? So when you file and you are approved, when you are filing, during the filing stage, in some of the, the parts of the form, it's going to ask you about your dependents, if you're married, uh, if there will be details about their name, maybe their passport number, their date of birth. That's the only thing it's going to ask you about your family members, right? Now, if you are approved, that's a good news. It's in the second stage of adjusting your status or you know, going through the immigration visa processing, for those of you outside the United States, it is at that stage that each of your family members will now have to file their own forms, which is called, uh, for those in the U.S., Form I-485. For those outside the U.S., Form I-824. That's when each family member will have to do that. And at that stage, all of you, that is the principal applicant whose case has been approved, and the beneficiaries, which is also called the de derivatives of that principal applicant, at that stage can all submit their next stage application together or separately. It doesn't matter. If the response is not clear enough, please uh, ask a follow-up question. Uh, Owen G, nice to have you here. Hello, sir. Do you have independent agencies that can assess a professional's ability, e.g. accountant? Does a membership of the American CPA strengthen my case? Now, let me start from the, from the latter. Uh, Owen, the truth is that if you hold a professional membership, a recognized professional member, excuse me, a recognized professional membership of any organization across the globe, it counts. Even if it's the organization is only from your own country, from your continent, or from America, it counts. But here is what I'm going to tell you. Here's the trick. If you are from any other country, have a professional, all the professional membership of organizations in your country. Nothing stops you from holding a professional membership of such organization in America, in the United States. Some of this application is even free of charge to enroll as a professional member. And some, you have to pay just a token to be a member. And there is no much criteria other than maybe, yes, you hold a bachelor's degree or there is even student membership. All this matters a lot in the EB2 NIW, it works. Uh, do, do I have an independent agency that can assess a professional ability? Um, well, there are uh, immigration lawyer. I am not a lawyer. Some people utilize the service of an immigration lawyer to help them you know, do their petition and they charge a very, very huge amount, up to like $10,000. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, so you might reach out to some of them. Some people also do consultation service. Um, you can check our, our website, which is also, uh, I'm going to put it in the description session. We also offer a consultation service. You, 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 you can freely reach out to us. Uh, we can check your profile for you. We can you know, help you see what you possess, if it can fly, if you have to add more things intentionally to it, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, I, Prof, since the COVID-19 pandemic, I have been doing some weekend or night nursing or carrying roles together with my nine to five. Does this carry any weight if I, if I certificate or any weight if I certificate or recommendation letters? Um, Owen, uh, honestly, I'm not sure if I understand the, this question very well, but let me just speak generally to it, that uh, if you have a work experience in your field 
and you have specific roles you've been doing that distinguish you in your field, it counts. You can always add that. Uh, it's 5 p.m. and I'm supposed to stop this session now, but I think I feel I love this atmosphere. I love the question coming in. I'm going to probably stop when I do not see any question further. Yeah. And uh, we're going to call it a day and see you in another time. But before I go, let me see. I have a question. For the third NIW prong, can a PhD student say it is unrealistic to get a labor certification form because you are a full time student? Uh, Adeshiji, please don't say so. Don't say so. I understand what you are trying to say for this third uh, prong, uh, which is, uh, if I remember, let me see. Um, all right, so this is what I'm going to say. Look at it this way. Look at it this way. Normally, labor certification or all these requirements for job offer, for any job, they normally list the requirements. Oh, you must possess this, you must have this, you must have that. Some of these job requirements, we only say, for example, you must hold a bachelor's degree, first degree in this field. They won't say maybe if you have a master's or something or PhD in process, they won't say that. So you can leverage on that, that a typical labor certification process for your field requires only a minimum requirement, which is having a bachelor's degree. However, you, the petitioner, holds a bachelor's degree. You hold a master's degree. In fact, you are currently a PhD student doing excellently well in your research field. And you've even gotten so many certifications that were not included in the labor certification process. And so if they are using that criteria to judge you in order to say you must have a job offer, that means they could lose such person that have such expertise. You know, does that make sense? You know, that's one of the ways you could do it. I'm going to direct you to a YouTube video. If you check Provdan Tutorials on that playlist, uh, you will see 13 videos. And uh, one of the videos addresses this third prong. So I have a video that addresses the first prong, talking about the substantial merit and national importance. The second prong, talking about that you're well positioned. This video will tell you how you can even write it out. So please utilize that. And the third prong, which you asked question on about, I also provided uh, a video on that. And I did a workshop using a successful petition. But this is what I'm going to tell you. Don't copy paste whatever you see as explained in the workshop. Use it to drive you in thinking in a direction of how you can write yours, especially if it's DIY, if you are doing it yourself. All right. Good luck. All right. This is interesting. I think we should continue. Please comment in the chat box uh if you are still there if you like the session please let me know give a comment uh give a suggestion about what you think if you think we should hold this again next month please make a comment if you are tired of this session as well please make a comment uh, i hope i'm not here to waste your time all right so uh for those of you that are trying to join the whatsapp chat uh you will be have to be approved in don't worry it might take two or three days for you to be approved into the chat don't worry about that. Kodri, uh, nice to have you here. Thank you, Prof. Dan, for this insightful section. I want to ask what happens if your initial application fails. Kodri, so you are asking a very good question. It happens. Things happen, right? See, let me tell you this, Kodri. Do you know that we have some individuals in the first instance, they went to an immigration lawyer. And the immigration lawyer will first assess them, their profile. And I'm, I'm being sincere to you. I'm using a case study of someone. And the immigration lawyer assessed the person's profile. And the lawyer said, I apologize. 
you do not qualify for the exceptional talent national interest waiver of EB2. And that was it. This person proceeded to understanding and knowing this process very well, what is required. And the person went ahead to file by himself. And guess what? This person got approval. I'm not trying to draw down on anyone here. What I'm trying to say is that it doesn't matter what someone might have said about your profile. It's all about understanding this process and knowing what exactly is expected of you and seeing how you can you know, craft your story, how you can craft your petition. So don't be dejected if someone says you do not qualify or maybe your field, you feel like, oh, it doesn't really make sense, my field. No, don't judge by that. We have people that have been successful. So please give it a try. And now, if your first application fails, let me tell you this. The good thing is that most people, you will not just get, oh, sorry, your application is not approved. That is not what you're going to get. If your application seems to have a little sense, what you might get is RFE, which is Request for Evidence. That is, the officer is saying, I'm not totally convinced about this area you're talking about. So they ask you to provide more evidence. Or you will see their feedback that, that says, oh, you claim this. Unfortunately, this is not, uh, it doesn't have any substantial merit or it's not contributing in any meaningful way to the US or globally or something like that. They will write all that. Does that mean you can't fight a gate? No. Once you see all that, some people go ahead to, you know, take a step. And when they take such step, their petition is revealed and uh, they, they, you know, they submit it again and they get approval. And uh, that's what it is. I know someone who got an RFE, very lengthy. And, uh, well, this person <laughs> is quite funny. This person, although the field is not STEM, is non-STEM, uh, the person didn't get the approval at first. And uh, this person uh, gave a petition to a colleague who utilized it and submitted, and the person got approved. And this same person is still struggling presently with her own, trying to you know, add more, more things to it. Well, I'm not saying you should do that. This is a live session. I'm just sharing what I, what I know. I hope I answered that question. Okay, so uh, thank you. You are doing a great job. Thank you so much, top five. Top five, thank you, respect. Uh, well, you know, see this as a free gift of human, trying to help as much people as possible. Uh, of course, everyone is so busy and I cannot freely help anyone. Uh, before now, I've been doing a very good job in helping people freely. But after a while, I was so overwhelmed and I feel, no, I can't continue that way because I have my own life too, you get? So uh, now our services are paid. If you really need our services, we're going to give our time and it's on first come, first serve. Uh, awesome section, thanks. Thank you. What are the common reasons why an application fails? Well, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Again, you know, if you are not able to convince the officer, then your application is going to be rejected. Uh, you have to convince the officer that is reading your case. You don't know who the person is, so you have to convince. That's one. Two, do you do your checkbox? Have you written about everything they ask you that they want to see in your petition? It's not just you trying to write a project. No. There, is, there are certain things you have to respond to. And those are some of the things we've been talking about in this session. So if you fail to respond to those things, magic is not going to make your case to be approved. Because this officer gives report on every unapproved petition. They must write about it. They write a report about it. So you don't want to give them reasons to write enough report about some sections of your petition, causing them to not approve your case. So this can be part of it. 
Um, you also want to make sure that uh, you provide all the necessary exhibits uh, if you want to lie, lie productively. Some people lie in their petition. Remember that some of these officers are psychologists and they can sense if you lie because what you said on page one does not really align in your story on page four or page seven or page like that. There is contradiction. Then, of course, the, the officer will probably say something is fishy, something is going on, and you could not even provide supporting evidence or exhibit to, to back up your claim. So your, your petition can be denied in such instance too. If you are not qualified, the first criteria says you must have an advanced degree. If you do not have an advanced degree and you apply, definitely that is no-go area as well. Someone pointed out that you have to respond to three prongs. If you respond to the first two, which people always respond to very well, but the third one, they take it for granted, and the third one did not address it properly, your case will still not be approved. Everything must be balanced. I wish you all the best. Um, I think we might stop here today. And uh, before then, before I end the session, um, let me see. Uh, all right, uh, I think we're going to continue in another time. Uh, thank you, sir. I tried to join the WhatsApp group. I didn't admit yet to approve. Yes, Sarah, someone is going to approve it. Do you need to submit your CV, uh, CV of your recommenders? Okay, so um, talk by, talk by, uh, I'm going to respond to that question. See, I stand to be corrected. There is no part of the USCIS website that says you must submit the CVs of your recommenders. You might find blogs and you know people that will say so, but from the credible source, nothing says so. However, for some of our clients, I must tell you the truth that, uh, for example, someone had about six recommenders. Uh, five of the recommenders had their CVs. The last one did not have a CV, and we put everything together like that, and the person still got approved. So um, one of the essence of CV is to, you know, again, these are officers judging your case based on what you have written or based on what you have provided. So if your recommender has written something, it also depends. There are some recommendation letter. There is also a video about 40 minutes on recommendation letter. Please go to the playlist on Provdan Tutorials and watch that. There are some recommendation letters that in the content, the recommenders already described in details about him or herself. And the recommendation letter already has like a letter edge showing the workplace, the contact info, email, phone number, you know, things like that, signature. And in that instance, such recommendation letter even if there is no CV, it might not be needed. Different from a recommendation letter that uh, you know doesn't have any of those things I've mentioned. And as an officer, I'm reading it, and I don't know who this person is. Then I'll be curious, who is this person? Could it be that you know you just drafted the recommendation letter by yourself, something like that? Then if such can be backed up with CV also, it would be great. So it's not cast on a stone. Uh, if you have the CV, please put it. For some of you, let me tell you, I know it might be difficult for you to get the CV of your recommenders. It might be tough. For some of them, they are on LinkedIn. From LinkedIn, you can generate their CV. Although it might not be up to date, but that's still something that can fly. For some of them, they have a company website or maybe those that are in university system, educational system, if you go to the website, you will see their profile. On such website, their departmental website, you could generate their CV and download it, publicly available. Why for some of your recommenders, you have to let them know that they should please kindly send you 
their CVs. And that is it. Do you need, uh, you missed my question, sir? I'm going to stop at this. Can you please provide me with a question in particular? I want to make sure I address all questions. I apologize. It's not intentional to have jumped or missed your question. Please kindly point me to the question you are referring to uh, at, the, at the CG, please. Why we await that, let me just round up with this that uh, as of January 5th, 2024, which is today, the costs for the EB2 and IW process includes one, uh, the I-140 petition filing fee, which is $700. Uh, for those of you that want to do premium processing from I-907, which is optional, is extra $2,500. And uh, here's the difference, just a quick one. If you only pay the $700, your petition is going to get to the USCIS office. And uh, the difference is that it might take about five months, six months, for example, before you get your feedback of your case is approved or not. However, if you are using a premium processing service, which is the form I-907 costing an additional $2,500, you can get your petition case approval or denial or request for evidence within the space of 45 days. And some people have even gotten it as quick as one week or even two weeks or even few days, depending on the queue and the, you know, the system. All right, so um, yeah, you're welcome, Fatima. Okay, I ask a follow-up question on the third prong about how can a PhD student say because he's still a full-time student, it is not possible to get a job offer. I think I addressed the question. However, um, I addressed this question. If you need more take on that, please check the playlist on this on the third prong. Uh, it will give you insight into this. Um, however, um, if you are a full-time student, it depends on your case. Are you a research assistant? Are you a teaching assistant? Are you a graduate assistant? And uh, you are doing a part-time job, 20 hours allowable per week, for your institution or department or your research team. If you are doing all that, you can leverage on that as well, beyond you just saying you're a full-time student. You don't have to make it that obvious uh, to respond to your third prong saying because you're a full-time student. No, no, ideally, you know, uh, yeah, you're a full-time student, then face your full-time studentship, you know? You don't want to let it appear that way. So you want to look, take it from another angle. And uh, so you can leverage on that. I hope uh, it's a bit clear. Best way to pay if you are outside the US. Oh, this is an excellent question. And uh, to be sincere with you, what the credible source says is that if you are outside the US, consult the consular office of your own country and they would direct you on how to make the payment. However, for many people, this has been, it has not really gone so easy, you know, different countries, system and the likes. One of the suggestions, just a suggestions I can give to you is that if you have a colleague, a friend and family in the US, let them assist you with the payments. You guys can, you know, make such transaction, maybe you send the money equivalent to them and they help you carry out the transaction so that it can be so easy. And um, yeah, that would probably be one of my advice, one of my greatest advice on this payment issue because there used to be issues with some issues with this payment system, especially for those that are using credit card, for example, because ideally, when you are submitting your petition, 
you don't put cash into your petition package when you want to send it. You don't put cash. You use either money order, which many people that reside in the US are aware of this. You just have to go to a center that you buy the money order, you fill it, and you attach it to your petition. When it gets to the USCIS office, they will draft the money out. Some use credit card, and when you are using credit card, you have to fill another form, which is called Form G11, Form G1450, if I'm right. Form G1450, I'm not so sure, uh, but there is a form you have to fill for if you are using credit card payment. And that form, what it entails is for you to put the details of the credit card and uh, for you to sign and show that, yes, you authorize USCIS to deduct the money once it gets to them. And in fact, recently, someone reached out to me who had an issue. Uh, you know, I always advise, if possible, don't use credit card payments. You know why? The 700 payments went successfully for this person. The 2,500 payments didn't go successfully. And so at that point in time, USCIS will not pro progress with your petition. They won't progress. And they also say that they're probably going to just try it one time. And some of the causes could be that your credit card, there is restriction as to the, the maximum amount that can be withdrawn at once or something like that. Or you have some of you, uh, when the transaction is taking place, your credit card company will send you a test message, indicate for security reasons to say if you approve it or not. If you are not with your phone when the transaction is taking place by the USCIS, it's denied, your petition will not progress. So um, there are issues with payments. I can only advise if you have any trustworthy person in the United States, let them help you carry out the transaction payments. But I personally, I lean towards money order, best way to pay. But uh, outside the US, I also made a video on payments methods. Please go through that video as well. Uh, yeah. I wish you all the best and uh, I am going to end the session. It's meant to be a one hour session, but now we've we'll spent about one hour, 23 minutes. Thank you for your patience. To all those that joined us for the very first live session, uh, thank you. And I hope uh, it's meaningful to you. For many of you that want to join the WhatsApp group, um, I'm going to add approve you. We're going to have our admin approve you. And please uh, feel free to reach out through that means and uh, find yourself other resources on our YouTube playlist to assist you if you want to self petition. And uh, I'm going to drop a last comment. And that will be it for today. Wishing you all the very best. Watch out for any other session we might be having in the nearest future. Take care and bye-bye. Stay blessed and God bless.